Thank you, David. I, I really believe that uh, a similar video about the Cuban reality will be very helpful. And we have to take the message uh, as far as possible. Uh, ahora nuestro próximo eh, panelista, eh, el señor Julio Chilin, eh, nos va a hacer su presentación. Eh, como ustedes está, saben, él es eh, un politólogo, director de Patria de Martí y también eh, parte del Advisory Board de la Fundación para la Democracia Panamericana. Por razones de tiempo, sin más preámbulo, Julio, adelante. Buenas tardes. Eh, yo voy a hacer la presentación en, en inglés por eh, consideración de, de David eh, y Marion y el, el propósito de precisamente eh, aunar fuerzas con eh, la, la institución el Víctimas del Comunismo, que es sumamente importante eh, de que el caso cubano pues, sea integrado con, con mayor eh, fuerza. A ver. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the Foundation for Pan American Democracy for sponsoring this uh, this event, an institution that I'm privileged to be on their advisory board and that does. Uh, tremendous work, particularly in, in, in Latin America, raising awareness uh, among uh, the people, particularly the young, in democratic values and ethics that are so important at this, uh, in this time. It's a pleasure to inaugurate, in effect, uh, the American Museum for the Cuban uh, Diaspora. It uh, truly is uh, beautiful and is very representative if you haven't had the opportunity to see the artwork, I, I really invite you to do so. It, it, it does portray a realistic message of what it is to uh, live under communism and the effects of such a, a horrible uh, system. I want to thank you all for, uh, for being here and thank God above all else for allowing all this. I'm going to attempt to incorporate what Carlos Alberto started, what Ileana Fuentes talked about, what Davy and, and this beautiful uh, uh, you know, presentation that you made uh, brings out because there is a common uh, denominator and that is in the monstrosity of a life under communism. And I'm going to try to to explain the title of this event, uh, 100 Years, 100 Million uh, Victims. Uh, next year, it will be 100 years that the Bolsheviks initiated the uh, communist revolution. And, you know, 100 million victims. In an era that was supposed to be a, an enlightened century, yet 100 million uh, people uh, perish. The, the, the curious thing is that non-democratic governance has really been the historical rule since, you know, recorded history. Despotism has fallen within two uh, prototypes. The authoritarian prototype, which is pretty much a proliferal uh, despotism. In other words, it just focuses exclusively on, on the political power, albeit you know, run by perhaps many of the people that also have privileged access to the economy, but nonetheless, not so much concerned with other uh, social aspects, social uh, domination. The totalitarian model it's really not so new as some people uh, believe. A uh, German uh, 
historian, Carl Whitfogel, did uh, brilliant work when he, uh, and, and you know, it wasn't just this Marxist historian that worked on this, uh, Marx and many other thinkers also did, where they looked at hydraulic societies. And, 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 I, and I'm bringing this into folks, focus because, again, my attempt is to somewhat explain how can this come about? A hundred million victims in a hundred years. I mean, that's an astronomical uh, uh, figure. And it's not that this happened in a war, right? So uh, Whitfogel's work focused on societies that depended exclusively on irrigation and that this dependency on irrigation formulated a bureaucracy and centralized power so much that in effect you had a society that was completely, completely dependent on the state for absolutely everything. Thomas Hobbes, you know, he's, he's not, uh, you know, uh, a modern uh, thinker. Many who credit him as the father of totalitarianism. Why? Because he validated the transfer of uh, legitimacy in absolute terms to the state as long as the state, you know, kept the peace and provided for you. In the early 18th century, late 17th century, we started to see a new ethical order uh, arise. You, we started seeing the underpinnings of what were the liberal revolutions in the United States and France, and the France, the non-Jacobin era. These were political models that were premised on a belief that natural rights mattered, that social contract theory had to incorporate natural rights, which today, to a great degree, is what we call first generation human rights. And the notion of pop, uh, popular sovereignty reached uh, at last a, a level unseen in history. This coincided with the advent of a new economic model, capitalism, which in effect liberated the worker. It untied the worker and allowed him to use his talents in a way that before the chains of primitive systems kept that in, in place. We saw the ushering of the industrial revolution as a result of uh, capitalism. And I know this is sort of like a chicken and hen thing. Some people will say, well, no, industrial revolution came first. No, no, no. Capitalism is what ushered in the industrial revolution. But there were challenges to this, challenges of adaptation to all the enormous progress of the industrial uh, revolution. And we saw certain models question what was happening in the United States and in uh, France. So we see the formation of the socialist movement. Now, the, the socialist movement, after a, you know, a couple of internationals, was basically at this point being fought between uh, the anarchist and some group that called themselves a scientific socialist, or thought they were scientifics, you know, the Marxists. Well, ultimately, the fight between those two factions was won by the, uh, the Marxists. But there were still a lot of unanswered questions. Unanswered questions as far as, well, you know, this, uh, do they have all the, all the answers? And then we see in the early 20th century the development of another type of socialism, a national socialism, which was later identified as fascism. So you had these two groups, communism and fascism, competing in the industrialized world for a lot of the same uh, people. And they really have enormous uh, similarities. I mean, you know, the fascists, well, they believe that they are interpreting the laws of nature. And they see race slash nation slash civilization as a struggle, a struggle that obviously they feel, you know, they are on the winning side and they could uh, help. Well, the, the communists sort of see things in the same way except with a different focus. They think they're interpreting laws of history. And they see the struggle as that of a class. But 
This explanation is important because the atrocities that have been committed do follow a rationalization and this must be combated. So we have the enemy of the model that facilitates it, but also the thinking that rationalizes this. There are four elements that fascism and communism have that are, that are extremely important to understand because this is at work today, right now, as we speak. This is not something of the past. The first common element is that they are political religions. They're materialistic, they're atheistic, but they are structured just like any other uh, religion, except, again, they are within the material world. Second, they are apocalyptic. By this I mean it's them or it's nothing. In other words, they are the only salvation that the world has. Without them, they have a monopoly on knowledge and only they could bring about the right answers. They follow an eschatology of, of eminence. And what I mean by this is, you know, the eschatology, the afterlife. They are set in focusing in this world, paradise. In other words, to create a paradise on earth. This is their, their vision. There's not much of an understanding of an afterlife or, or of, you know, of a supernatural. It's here, it's now, and that all, that's all there is. And the fourth element is they're expansionist. Now, they've relied, fascism and, 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 and communism, and I bring them together, and I know that nothing will bother a communist more than to tell him he's no different than a fascist. So this is important, and I just don't do this to bug them, I do this because it's the truth. And they follow similar patterns, and if we, you know, if we wanna understand uh, why communism is where it's at, well, you know, they've picked up a lot from fascism. First, you know, ideology, you know, the, the world view, when we say, well, you know, What's the difference between that and philosophy, right? Well, philosophy is, is you know, you're contemplating. Is, is basically, you know, you sit back, you're looking, you know, you're looking for answers. Ideology does that, but ideology has a plan of political action. In other words, how you see the world, you're gonna have a political prescription for the remedy. And ideology doesn't necessarily have to be bad. We all have ideological uh, visions. But radical ideology has no limits, has no respect for, there's nothing preemptive, there's nothing that is a border. Whereas all ideology that's within the democratic realm, well, you know, you respect the rule of law, you respect a natural right, you respect certain things that are there not because the government gave them to you, but because they are there by uh, nature. The Jacobins, during their two-year rule in France, were in effect the first ideological regime to be in power. Now the problem that they had is, they didn't have technology on their side. Yes, they controlled the cities very effectively, but out in the countryside, they were unable to do something that uh, totalitarian regimes need to do, and that's mass mobilization. Well, they, they, you know, in the countryside, life was a little bit different. So they had this to their disadvantage. The Bolsheviks, on the other hand, despite their backwardness, came to power in an era where technology facilitated their outreach, and they were able to effectually, effectively mobilize the masses and institute a reign of terror that truly trespass, not just urban areas. Ideology rationalizes barbarism. Do not think for one minute, and, and, and we hear a lot about the, 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 the horrible undertaking of Hitler's final solution, which it is, but that also followed a rationalized thinking in ideological terms, no less different than what uh, the communists have done since at the beginning. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, by the way, and some you know, may, may, may argue this point, but uh, in my estimation, he is the father of radical ideology. He is the individual that opened the door to the possibilities 
of destruction in the name of, of uh, doing some good. But it is in the totalitarian rule where the ideology that commits these crimes, and in the case of communism, committed the 100 million uh, uh, murders, has been able to do it. Very simple. It's the organization of political power and society to fit those means. I encourage everyone who can read, you know, anything that Hannah Arendt wrote to do so. Uh, your life will be, you know, more richer for it. Uh, she had a great grasp of the details of what a, a totalitarian regime worked, how it, uh, uh, why it, it, it is as, as a successful machine-keeping power as it is. And totalitarianism is not an ideology, but it's an operation mode that, in essence, facilitates the pursuits of ideology. It's been done by stimulating, first of all, fomenting a counterculture. In other words, distorting reality, enforced, of course, by terror, so that the view that the regime wants to portray. When uh, Miss Canada was talking about uh, all the belief system, well, all this is a counterculture, values a distortion of history, of, of, of facts, taking out of context things that occur, all this is part of a necessary mechanism to be able to maintain the power and keep society domesticated. The problem is that this totalitarian culture has a, a, a terrible price. I mean, you have alienation, you have learned helplessness, where you have serious anthropological scars that truly handicap a society to understand uh, what democratic institutions are and to uh, exclude them from uh, modernity. But the death of fascism, which, you know, Hitler's divorce from Stalin is what prompted this. Otherwise, you know, because they fought each other off, competing for the same uh, people, but you know, they got married, they decided to divide the world, but Hitler decided that, that he wanted a divorce and, you know, he sent his pap divorce papers by way of, you know, German tanks and surprised uh, Stalin. Well, that was in essence a death sentence for, for fascism. FDR, who we can credit for facilitating the defeat of fascism, unfortunately contributed to the strength of uh, communism at Yalta, giving away half a continent. But there was a strenuous denazification process in fascist Europe because the Allies knew the dangers of having a regime such as this. You had your Nuremberg trials, which is basically the prelude to what today is the International Penal Court. You have and still have anti-fascist laws all throughout Europe designed to avoid anti-systems that have a, a fascist current from being able to uh, reach power. Yet communism has survived. Yes, Soviet communism fell, but, well, that really was, that was a slip, it really wasn't a fall. Yes, what we had is a decolonization of, of Eastern Europe, but I want to cite five figures that are extremely relevant to communism because if we look at these five figures, we can identify where communism is today, where it's going to go, and where the challenge for Democrats is if we truly want to leave this as part of the past. The first is Frederick Engels. Now, Engels is the inventor of Marxism. Engels is the person who simplified Marxism. He made it sellable. He made sure that influential intellectuals understood what Marx said, because very frankly, very few people did. But he made sure that they understood. He wrote it in simple terms. He even coined the, the phrase. So this teaches us the importance of simplicity, of, of getting complex ideas and making them an emotional factor, which he did brilliantly. Lenin, well, 
Lenin freed Marxism from the shackles of its falsi falsification. He said, well, wait a minute, no, no. There's been some processes here that if we just jump over, we'll be okay. But he also invented, a very pragmatic individual, he also invented a true mechanism to keeping in place a notion called democratic centralism, as, as democratic centralism which in effect uh, identifies the Leninist state, which means that uh, they will not move or deviate from their premise. And when we look at what happened with, uh, with Gorbachev, well, Gorbachev deviated from that in order to be able to do what the Chinese did, which he couldn't find the support for. So Lenin's contribution cannot be underestimated because he devised the political structure to facilitate all this. The third individual, uh, we have to understand the relevance that he has in, in communism is Antonio Gramsci. And that is his emphasis on culture. He argued, you know, with many Marxists, he was, you know, of course a Marxist, he argued that, you know, economics is not what determined things. It's not the most important thing. Culture is. And just a side note, I, and I want to make this clear because I'm not being an apologist for fascist jails. I, I, I am sure that uh, you know, they are not a nice place to be. But this man wrote 3,000 pages while being in a fascist jail. You know, uh, and I know that in the audience there are you know, quite a number of political prisoners. I don't think that you know, they've been able to write 3,000 pages of, of, uh, of work. So Gramsci, in effect, while he was, you know, in, in a six-year period, wrote 30 notebooks, which basically, among many things, outlined the need for a primacy focus on culture. Because if you control a culture, you will influence how people think. The fourth person is Deng, Deng Xiaoping. Very simple. He impacted the economy. He perfected what Lenin saw in, the new, in 1921 with the new economic policy. He realized that we just need to alter the uh, production relations. We need to look at private property in a different way. And this, fascists had it right all along. They said, you know, let them be in private hands. We will control uh, the means of production indirectly. <laughs> they either produce for what we say or they're out of business. Well, this is in essence what Deng, uh, what he learned. So his impact in redefining the, the, the production relations and the economy has been fundamental in explaining why Asian communism is still around. And the last individual that I want to name as, as being truly, truly fundamental to the survival of communism is Fidel Castro. Uh, communist Cuba, in effect, introduced and harbored a bridge that was a difference between the Chinese and the Soviets. The bridge of, well, who's the agent of change? The farmer or the, you know, the or urban worker. Well, uh, the, the Cuban Communist Revolution, in effect, said, well, you know, we don't have to be so picky. Let's open the doors to everyone. Intellectuals, let's open the doors. Anyone that's an anti, if you're anti-American, you're anti-capitalism, let's look for the anti. And in this aspect, completely changed the, the rigid vision that both the Soviet Union had and the Chinese uh, had. When the communism, Soviet communism fell, it was Cuba that rescued intellectually and strategically the communist movement by transferring the base to Latin America. Hence, you see the proxy states of Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, Nicaragua. All this has been facilitated from the relationship that Castro had with Lula da Silva and since 1991, in effect, changed strategy that it was much more efficient to reach power through democratic institutions than uh, overly challenging them with arms in the, in the guerrillas. These five figures, the simplification that Engels use, the appeal to the emotion, Lenin's insistence on a rigid, centralized state power not to deviate in political aspects, Gramsci's focus on the importance of dominating culture. 
Den's ability to have a hybrid economy that still served the interest of the dictatorial Leninist state, but allowed for enough prosperity to avoid famines. And Castro's uh, open door policy of not discriminating against anyone that's willing to challenge who they perceived as a bigger, as a bigger enemy. In my conclusion, what does today's communist look like? Well, he could be a businessman, a pope, a pseudo-democrat. Class struggle fundamentalism has partnered with commercial interest, with cultural elites, and with the hierarchy of organized religion. Dr. Dr. Vento is a medical doctor, and I know he's an, he'll appreciate this brief explanation that I'm going to give. Communism is like a cancer. And what do you do with a cancer? Well, you, you need to have a strong response, take it out, you know, uh, if possible, put you know, strong radiation. But you need to continue with prescription. You need to continue with a lifestyle change. You need to continue with prayers. You need to have a permanent observation and monitoring of that situation. It is not just an issue of took it out and you don't need to do anything else. My friends, until communism is defeated, tried, sentence and ostracize, we will continue to have victims, we will continue to have movements that conspire to subvert democratic countries. This must be our fight. It is a pleasure to be partnering with uh, victims of, uh, of communism because the struggle continues. The enemy has not gone away. And I'm not just saying this for the six countries that remain, China, North Korea, Vietnam, Tibet, uh, Laos and Cuba, but I'm talking about all the other proxies, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador, and all the movements where they are currently right now, even in countries that are democracies in Eastern Europe. So, you know, let's take the, the step from the doctors when they treat an ill. It must be monitored. That is the only way that we could avoid putting a, stopping the hemorrhage of a million plus victims. Thank you so much and God bless you.